When there are princes to dinner, the lady of honor must be there with one or two ladies of the palace. I was designated today. The princes of Nassau, Weilberg, Dassenberg, and Nassau, Usingen came into the drawing room this evening, which was very brilliant. Mance, September 17th, Madame de la Rochefoucauld and I remarked a very extraordinary thing this evening, namely the eager cordiality of Monsieur de Calencourt towards the princes of Baden. He thought it incumbent on him to do them honors of the salon. When I knew that these princes were to be here, I was very curious to observe their first interview with him. I suppose that not having seen them since he abducted the Duke Dungeon from their dominions, and this abduction having had such fatal consequences, he would, by keeping himself at a distance and not recalling by the sight of him the bitter affront he had offered them, silently prove by his countenance that when he executed this order, he was far from foreseeing this horrible results. But I was very much deceived. He went up to them with a gaiety which seemed very natural. As soon as the princess arrived, he was at their side. He took absolute possession of them. It seemed as if the acquaintance he had made with them in so dismal a manner ought to entitle him to their goodwill. This conduct confounds me. One must be devoid of tact. Of the slightest sentiment of what is befitting in order to act thus, the father, who is already old, timid, as people are at that age, always trembling lest he should see the almighty hand of the emperor raise him from the list of sovereigns, displayed almost no external sign on beholding Monsieur de Calencourt, the countenance of his grandson, the hereditary prince, who has as yet no character, and I believe very little intelligence, was no better an indication of what was going on within. But with regard to Prince Louis, I noticed that whenever Monsieur de Calencourt approached them, he drew back beside his father and his nephew, and that as far as possible he avoided speaking with them. But this reserve detracted nothing from Monsieur de Calencourt's case. When I say case, I mean relatively, for no one has less than he, he might be mistaken for a Prussian rather than a French officer, even his phrases have a German turn. For in speaking to the emperor or the empress, he never fails to say yes and no, your majesty. It is extraordinary that Monsieur de Calencourt, whose parents were at court, should not know its usages better. September 18th, I think the emperor greatly resembles the man who, bored by the arguments which a wise person, adduced in proof of his opinion, exclaimed, Hey, sir, I don't want people to prove things to me. He was greatly tempted to say as much this evening. The prince arch-chancellor, who is specially gifted with that analytical spirit which decomposes an idea to its utmost principle, discussed with him a metaphysical question of Kant. But the emperor settled the question by saying that Kant was obscure and that he did not like him. Then he rudely left the prince, who came and sat down near me. For an observer, there was a very amusing combat going on between the determination of the prince courtier to admire everything in the emperor and the little dissatisfaction at having been cut short in the midst of his discussion on his dear philosopher, for he is a great partisan of Kant. He remarked to me as a general thesis that people often disparage works of pure reasoning solely on account of the trouble they must take to comprehend them, that people consider nothing well thought but what they can understand without trouble, but that it is with a profound idea as it is with water, the depth of which destroys its limpidity, that nothing is easier with the help of intermediary ideas than to elevate minds, even the most mediocre, to the loftiest conceptions, that nothing is required for this but to perfect analysis and to decompose a question, and that if the foundation of it is true, it can always be reduced to a single point. I profited by his little annoyance with the emperor, an annoyance he would not have owned to for all the world, and found great pleasure in chatting with him. Mayence, September 19th, the princess of Hesternstadt, her son the hereditary prince, and the young princess Wilhelmina of Baden, whom he has just married, will arrive tomorrow. Josephine cannot conceal her lively curiosity 
need to see this young woman. Mr. de Talleyrand used to speak of her to the emperor as the prettiest person in Europe when he was lately urging him to be divorced. This evening, I heard Josephine asking her brother, the hereditary prince, a multitude of questions about his sister. One can see that, although reassured about the divorce, she would be annoyed if the sight of her could occasion the emperor any regrets. September 20th, at last we have seen this much-wanted princess, and never was there such a general surprise. One cannot imagine how any charm could be discovered in her. She is of, I will not say a height, but a length beyond measure. There is not the least proportion in her figure, which is much too thin and utterly wanting in grace. Her eyes are small, her face is long and without expression. Her skin is very white and with little color. It is possible that in some years when she is formed, she may be a good enough looking woman, but at present she is not at all attractive. I was charmed that Josephine should have had this little triumph, which she has so well enjoyed. Never perhaps has she displayed such grace as she put into this reception. As a general thing, one is so benevolent, so gracious when one is happy. One could see that she was delighted to find the princess so little agreeable and so different from what Napoleon had been told. The princess's mother must have been charming. She has the most sprightly and agreeable countenance. She has much vivacity and wit. She entirely governs her little dominions and her husband. Her son, the hereditary prince, is very tall and handsome, but I think... That one has said that? One has said all. September 21st, the Prince of nassau Valberg, having left his yacht here at Josephine's orders for all the time that she remains, we made use of it this morning to go to breakfast on an island in the Rhine near Mayence, where the elector's country seat, the favorite, used to be. No trace of it remains. It has been demolished. This island, as well as the environs of Mayence, offers a very sad picture of the results of war. Not a tree is to be seen. When we arrived, we found the breakfast ready. While we were at table, the emperor perceived a poor woman who, not daring to advance, was looking from a distance at this spectacle so new to her. He sent her word to come near. She was close to the table. He had asked her in German, for she did not understand French if she had ever dreamed that she was rich, and if so, what she had believed herself to possess. The poor woman found it difficult to answer this question, and still more so to answer it at last. She said that she thought a person who had 500 florins would be the richest person in the world. Her dream is a little dear, said the emperor, but no matter, it must be realized. At once, these gentlemen took all the money they had with them, and this sum was counted out to her. The astonishment and joy of this woman was the most touching thing. Her hands let fall the gold pieces, which they could not contain. All eyes were moistened with tears of emotion on beholding the surprise and happiness of the poor creature. I was looking at the emperor at this moment. I thought he must be happy. No! His physiognomy expresses... Nothing! Absolutely nothing! But a little ill humor! I have asked the same thing twice before, said he. But their dreams are so moderate! This good woman is ambitious! At that moment he had no other sensation than that of regret. That she had asked so much! How wretched this man is! Of what use is his immense power to him if he cannot enjoy the happiness he might diffuse? After breakfast, we scattered around the island for a walk. The empress, accompanied only by me and two other persons, met a young woman who was suckling her infant. Her situation was not fortunate. Josephine had nothing about her but 25 franc pieces. She gave these to the woman without display, without ostentatious. And a tear of pity fell on the infant which she had taken in her arms and which was caressing her with its little hands as if it felt the good she had just been doing to its mother and wished to thank her on our return to Mance. The emperor chatted a good deal, or rather he talked because he never chats. I shall never forget while I live in the singular definition he gave us, the happy, the definition of happiness and unhappiness. There's neither happiness nor unhappiness in the world, said he. The only difference is that the life of a happy man is a picture with a silver background and some black stars. 
and the life of an unhappy man is a black background with some silver stars. If anyone comprehends this definition, I do not. And I have not the resources of applying the precept of the Archchancellor, who claims that the most obscure metaphysical question, providing it rests upon a droidia, may always be understood by the aid of analysis. Here I decompose, I analyze, and I find zero. Mayans. September 22nd, 1804. Yesterday, the two princesses of Hesdarmstadt, who were to leave Mayans today, were at dinner. In the evening, they went to the theater. These ladies had no shawls, and Josephine, fearing lest that they should be cold, sent for two to lend them. This morning, on going away, the princess's mother wrote a very witty, very amiable note to the empress to say that she would keep the shawls as a souvenir. The billet was very neatly worded, but I thought I saw that it did not console Josephine for the loss of her two shawls, which she thought the most beautiful of all her white shawls. She would have liked it better if these women had chosen others. Mans, September 24th. Yesterday, on quitting the salon, Madame de la Rouchefoucauld and I stood up for Frankfurt. We hoped that this rapid excursion might remain unknown to the emperor. We spent the morning visiting the city and buying some English goods, which Josephine had asked us to fetch her, for she was in our confidence. We left Frankfurt at three in the afternoon, with the intention of arriving in Mans at six. Having been designated for dinner yesterday, I did not expect to be so again today, and I thought that I should have all the time I needed to rest myself, dress, and appear in the sun at eight o'clock. As to Madame de la Rochefoucauld, her health is so poor that she counts it on excusing herself this evening on the grounds of being indisposed. But all this arrangement was brought to naught, at least so far as I was concerned. On arriving, I found a billet from the first chamberlain which designated me for dinner. It wanted ten minutes of six, and five minutes past six, I was at table. I tried to make up for the precipitation of my toilet by selecting a very beautiful dress. I was solicitating myself while eating my soup and having arrived soon enough not to betray the secret of our journey when the emperor, with a rather sarcastic smile, said to me that my dress was very fine and asked whether I had brought it back from Frankfurt. There was no way of denying our trip. It was necessary to laugh and make a joke of the affair so that the emperor should not be angry, and that is what I did. He asked if we had brought much English merchandise. But as nothing seemed to have annoyed him today, he was only half displeased. Mayans, September 25th. The city of Mayans gave a grand ball to the Empress today, but being very much indisposed, it seemed impossible for her to attend it. She was in her bed at five o'clock, perspiring profusely with fever. Napoleon came into her room and told her she must get up and go to this ball. Josephine, having explained to him that she was suffering and the danger of throwing off her coverings, as she had an eruption on her skin, Bonaparte took her by the arm, pulled her out of bed, and forced her to dress. Madame de la Rouchefoucauld, who witnessed this brutal action, told me of it with tears in her eyes. Josephine, with her touching sweetness and submission, dressed herself and appeared at the ball for half an hour. Mayans. September 26th, I suffered incredibly on hearing Napoleon call the princesses of Nassau, who were in the drawing room, mademoiselles. However little attraction this court may have for me, it is nonetheless true that I form a part of it at present, and as a French woman, I feel humiliated that the sovereign in whose suite I find myself should be so little accustomed to the usages of courts. How can he be ignorant that princes among themselves give each other their respective titles without thereby derogating from their authority? But Bonaparte would think he was compromising his own entirely if he did so. He never fails to say, Mr. Elector to the Prince Archancellor and Mademoiselle to other princesses. I have seen more than one slightly ironical smile at it. Mayence. September 27th, the Empress crossed the Rhine this morning to pay a visit to the Prince and Princess of Nassau at the Chateau of Bilberich, and that's near Mayence. The troops of the Prince were under arms, 
and all the officers of his little court in full dress. A very elegant breakfast was served in the hall from which the ride could be seen for a great distance, affording a magnificent view. It is grand and a superb habitation. On returning to Mayence, the troops of the prince accompanied the empress as far as the banks of the Rhine. Mayence, September 28th. Napoleon said today before 40 persons to Madame Lorges, whose husband commands the division, Ah, Madame, what a horrible dress you have on. It is exactly like an old tur curtain. That's German taste, surely. Madame Lorges is German. I do not w know whether the dress is in German taste, but what I do know is that this compliment was not in French taste. Mayence, September 29th. This evening, as I was chatting with two persons in a corner of the salon, I do not know how the conversation led me to mention that the Emperor of China, who asked Confucius how people talked about him and his government. Nobody talks, the philosopher told him. Everyone keeps silence. That's what I want, replied the Emperor. Napoleon, who was not far from me, chatting with the Prince Dessenberg, turned around quickly. If I live a thousand years, I shall never forget the threatening glance he darted at me. I did not disturb myself about it. I continued my conversation and added that this Emperor of China resembled a good many others, who are like little owls, which scream when a light is brought into their nest. I do not know whether Napoleon sees the meaning of this last phrase, but he probably felt that he had made a mistake in seeming to make a personal application of this story <laughs> about the Chinese emperor, for his countenance resumed that immobility, that total lack of expression, which he knows how to give himself at will. Mayence, October 1st, 1804. We left Mayence yesterday in order to return to Paris where we shall be in a few days. The authorities of all the countries we pass through give themselves incredible pains to compose our ranks. But in truth, it is a lost labor. For I notice that they are all alike. From that of the mayor of the petty German village to that of the president of the Senate, they might all be translated by that fable in which the fox says to the lion, You enter them, my lord. Too much in crunching them. Chapter 21 Nothing is to be contemned in what relates to great men. Posterity shows itself eager to know their manner of life and its most minute circumstances, their inclinations, their slightest habits. Whenever I happen to go to the theater, either in my brief moments of leisure or in the suite of His Majesty, I remarked how much the spectators like to see some great historical person represented on the stage with his costumes, his gestures, his attitudes, and even his infirmities and his defects, such as they have been transmitted in the descriptions of his contemporaries. I have myself always taken the greatest pleasure in seeing these living portraits of celebrated men. I remember very well that I never enjoyed the theater so much as on the day when I saw played for the first time that charming piece. The two pages. Fleury, who took the part of Frederick the Great, rendered so perfectly the slow gait, the abrupt speech, the brusque movements, and even the short sightedness of that monarch, that from the time when he came on the stage, the whole theater resounded with applause. According to the opinion of people who were qualified to judge, it was the most perfect and most faithful imitation. For me, I could not say whether the resemblance was exact but I felt that necessarily it must be. Michelot, whom I have since seen in the same part, has given me no less pleasure than his predecessor. No doubt these two clever actors must have drawn from good sources in order to know and reproduce in this way the manners of their model. I confess that I experienced some pride in thinking that these memoirs may impart to their readers something similar to that pleasure I have here essayed to diatribe, and that in a doubtless remote future, yet one which cannot fail to arrive, the artist who shall seek to revivify and present before spectators the greatest man of the age will be obliged, if he desires to be a faithful imitator, to rule himself in accordance with the portrait which I better than anyone else can delineate from nature. I think, moreover, that no one has done it yet, at least not with so much detail. 
On his return from Egypt, the emperor was very meager and very yellow, his complexion coppery, his eyes sunken, his shape perfect, although rather slender then. I think the portrait made by Monsieur Horus Vernet in his picture, Une Revue du Premier Consul sur la Place du Carousel, is very like him. His forehead was very high and open. He had not much hair, especially on his temples, but it was very fine and soft. It was of a chestnut color, and his eyes were a beautiful blue, which depicted in an agreeable manner the different emotions which agitated him, sometimes extremely soft and caressing, and again severe and hard. His mouth was very beautiful, his lips smooth and somewhat contracted, especially in ill humor, his teeth without being very regular, were very white and very good. He never complained of them. His nose, Grecian in form, was irreproachable, and his sense of smell exceedingly keen. In fine, the ensemble of his face was regularly handsome. Nevertheless, at this epoch, his extreme meagerness prevented his beauty of feature from being discerned and gave his whole physiognomy a somewhat disagreeable effect it would have been necessary to go over his features one by one and then recombine them in order to comprehend the perfect regularity and beauty of all. His head was large, being 22 inches in circumference, and it was a little longer than it was wide, and consequently a trifle flattened on the temples. It was extremely sensitive, so that I had to wad his hat, and I took care to wear them several days on my own. So as to break them in, his ears were small, perfectly shaped, and well-placed. The emperor's feet were also extremely sensitive. I had his shoes worn by a wardrobe boy named Joseph, whose feet was just like that of the emperor. His figure was five foot two inches, three lines in height. His neck was rather short, his shoulders thrown back, his chest large, and very slightly hairy, and his thigh and leg well molded. His foot was small with regular toes and completely exempt from corns and calluses. His arms were well made and well attached. His hands admirable and his nails did not disfigure them. Hence he was very careful of them and indeed of his entire person. But without being finical, he often bit his nails but lightly. This was a sign of impatience or preoccupation. Later, he put on a good deal of flesh, but without losing the beauty of his figure. On the contrary, he looked better under the empire than under the consulate. His skin became very white and his color animated. In his moments, or rather in his long hours of work and meditation, the emperor had a particular tie, which seemed to be, oh, tick, which seemed to be a nervous movement and which he retained throughout his life. It consulted in a frequent and rapid elevation of the right shoulder, which persons who did not know this habit sometimes construed into a gesture of discontent and disapprobation and began anxiously to wonder how and what they could have done to displease him. He never thought of it for his own part and kept on repeating the same movement without being aware of it. A very remarkable peculiarity is that the emperor never felt his heart beat. He has often said that so both to Mr. Carissar and to me, and more than once he had us pass our hands over his breast so that we could make trial of this singular exception. We never felt any pulsation. The emperor ate very fast. He scarcely remained a dozen minutes at table. When he had finished dining, he rose and went into the family sitting room, but the Empress Josephine remained and signaled the guests to do likewise sometimes. However, she followed his majesty, and then the ladies of the palace doubtless indemnified themselves in their apartments where they were served with whatever they desired. One day, when Prince Eugène rose from the table, immediately after the emperor, the latter turned and said, But you have not had time to dine, Eugène. Pardon me, replied the prince. I dined beforehand. The other guests probably thought it was not a useless precaution. It was before the consulate that things took place in this way, for afterwards the emperor, even while he was only first consul, dined 
tete-a-tete with the empress unless he invited some member of his household to his table. Sometimes one and sometimes another, and all received this favor with joy. He had already a court at this epoch. Most frequently, the emperor breakfasted alone on a round mahogany stand and without a napkin. This repast, still shorter than the other, lasted from eight to ten minutes. I shall say presently what disastrous effects this bad habit of eating quickly often produced on the emperor's health. In addition to this habit, and even as a first result of his haste, the emperor by no means ate in a cleanly manner. He preferred to use his fingers instead of a fork or even a spoon. We were careful to put the dish he liked best within his reach. He drew it to him in the fashion I have just described, dipping his bread in the sauce and in the gravy, which did not prevent the dish from circulating. Anyone ate of it who could, and there were few guests who could not. I have even seen some who seemed to consider this singular act of courage as a mean, means of making their court. I am willing to believe also that in several, the admiration for his majesty, silenced all repugnance just as one does not scruple to eat from the plate and drink from the glass of a person one loves even were it not wholly immaculate as to cleanliness which one does not see because passion is blind the dish the emperor liked best was that species of chicken fricassee which has been called Pule a la Marengo, on account of this preference of the conqueror of Italy. He also liked to eat beans, lentils, roast breast of mutton, and roast chicken. The simplest dishes were those he preferred, but he was not easy to please in the quality of his bread. It was not true that the emperor made or has been affirmed an immoderate use of coffee. He took merely half a cup after his breakfast and another after his dinner. Still, it sometimes happened when he was preoccupied that he took two cups in succession without noticing it. But coffee drunk in such a quantity disturbed and prevented the emperor from sleeping. Often, too, he would chance to take it cold or without sugar or with too much to remedy these inconveniences. The Empress Josephine took charge of pouring the emperor's coffee. The Empress Marie Louise likewise adopted this custom. And the Emperor rose from table and passed into the little salon. A page followed him, carried a silver gilt tray, on which were a coffee pot, a sugar bowl, and a cup. Her Majesty the Empress poured the coffee herself, sugared it, swallowed a few drops to taste it, and offered it to the Emperor.